face the final frontier. Hi, this is Larry Greenblatt. Welcome back to How to Pass the CISSP with our good friends, Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk. And this episode, episode three, is on security architecture and engineering. All right, so if you've made it this far, you should be pretty familiar with my uh, clarification of the difference between subjective or qualitative reasoning versus objective or quantitative. So uh, very quickly again, this is Lieutenant Ohura. She's a subject, she is playing the Vulcan harp. And um, whatever subject plays it, even this subject at any given moment might play different music. And is it good? Well, it depends on what the subject likes at that moment in time. Uh, but the harp has four knobs and 30 strings. And no matter who plays it, that's the quantity of knobs and strings. So quantitative thinking is always the same, no matter who measures it, or objective thinking. And subjective or qualitative really depends on a particular person at any particular moment. So Spock is my quantitative guy or my objective thinker. Kirk is my qualitative person and my subjective thinker. And again, I like to have these guys on my shoulders instead of a, a devil and an angel advising me whenever I do anything, really. And uh, especially we're going to use them to help us pass our test. So uh, I've been through this many times. I want to go over this quickly again. But we know that costs are very quantitative. I can tell you what something costs. I could show you a receipt. And no matter who measures it, they should see the same price. Um, but what is it worth? Some people might tell you, that's junk. Why did you pay that so much for that? And other people are like, wow, you got such a bargain. So it depends. It depends on the subject and what they want at that given time. Certification is always the same. If you're certain that it has uh, four knobs, it will, it's, it's four knobs. Every day after day after day, it's going to be four knobs unless somebody changes it. But the value um, uh, or accreditation is really subjective. So you might say something cred means to believe. You might believe that something is very good today and tomorrow change your mind. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like that so much anymore. I got sick of it. You know? uh, when we take our test, we are taking a multiple choice uh, test and there's four answers. And there, it's not like one right and one wrong or three wrong. There's um often they might all seem right or they might all seem wrong uh, subjectively. Quantitatively, you try to prove as much wrong as you can. So if uh, you know some things are very quantitative, if, if they ask you how many uh, bytes in a MAC address, well, it's six bytes. That's just how it is. And, and, and if the number says anything else, I mean, you could express it different ways. You could say it's 48 bits. Or you could say that it's uh, 12 hex digits, but either way, it's the same quantity. Any other quantity of bits or bytes or, or, or nibbles would be wrong. But sometimes you're left over with uh, some answers are very subjective. And you're like, I don't know, I, I just, I feel that this is a better one. So I always let Spock take the test first. And Kirk is watching the clock and he's, he's, he's mostly concerned with time and money. And he knows that you've got three hours in 2018 with the, the latest cat version of the test. And you've got uh, up to 150 questions to answer. So he's going to watch your clock and say, Spock, where are we on question 34? And Spock, so I proved whatever A and C wrong. Is it B or D? Insufficient data, Captain. I don't know. And then Kirk will just try to feel what answers better based on the amount of time you have. Uh, this great book called uh, Blink many years ago came out by Mal Malcolm Gladwell. He wrote The Tipping Point and a couple other books. Um, and he was very good at, at, at um, into when you've studied a subject, your first guess is statistically very accurate. So once you've studied for your test, and then Spock answers a question, he can prove certain answers wrong. You're going to have to guess. Don't, well, now you can't go back. You used to be able to go back. And the, the reverse of test, once you guess it, that's it. So that might be a good thing. You can't go back now. So just make a guess and, uh, at a certain point and just move on. Let it go. Um, we have a federation that we deal with, and you'll be tested on it. It's the ISO. And again, many people think that's an acronym. It's not. It's a word. My mother taught me that uh, just about every word in the English language comes from the Greek, even though she's not Greek, but whatever it was. Uh, and we need to know that. Like, I've had people doing forensics for years, and they don't know the meaning of the word. Forensics come from the Greek. It means to be in a forum. 
I don't, I've very rarely met anybody who, who understands the meaning of the word risk. Risk come from the Greek. Cyber and govern both have the same root word, uh, the kubernon, the helmsman of a ship in Greek. In Greek. Um, so cyber really means to steer just as govern does. We need to govern ourselves. When, when you uh, govern, you can, uh, well, security is about prevention, detection, and response. You can prevent the dangers you can see, but you can't prevent dangers you don't see. Risk are cliffs under the water, things the helmsman of the ship could not see. So you had to have uh, you know, somebody uh, awake all the time, watching out for these things, and they had to have ways to not only detect, but to respond. They have to have lifeboats and evacuation procedures to deal with these unforeseen dangers. So risk actually today means something like unforeseen danger. The ISO itself uh, comes from a Greek word. It means equal. And um, that's a great thing about this show, Star Trek, that uh, you remember the Federation, you were treated as an equal. And you didn't have to be a member of the Federation to be treated equally. They tried to treat everybody, but they tried to incorporate you into the, in the Federation whenever possible. All right, so I like to have Spock and Kirk sit down and test, and Kirk reads the question to Spock, and then Spock tries to prove certain answers wrong. Processing multiple levels of information classifications on the same machine requires special controls to prevent data leakage and corruption. Which multi-level security model requires prevention of data processed at lower levels writing to higher levels? I'm going to go with, I want to explain to you what uh, multi-level security is. There's really two models that we deal with out of multiple levels. The Lepagelet Biba. So Spock will uh, look at this and hmm. I've never been to this planet. Bella, Padula, and Bieber are people's names. If you didn't root memorize those things, how would you know? You can't logically sound that out. You can't figure that out. Like my mother told me that words come from the Greek and so she should say, try and sound it out. What do you think the word means? But my father would tease and say, all right, try to reason out the word sandwich. I didn't have a Greek origin or, you know, that, that would make sense. It was a guy's name. It was the Earl of Sandwich place whatever and uh he liked to put his food between two slices of bread so he saw he could sit there sand and it was a witch so some things you can't reason out like that bella patch and people um state machine spock could figure out he could say well no it's not the state machine model captain it's not bro state machine refers to tracking how things change state so we have the beginning state the middle state the, the end state uh, when it, as a machine boots up it should boot security it should run security even in a failure mode, it should fail secure. And let's imagine that Spock knows what CMMI is. CMMI is a model, but it's a maturity model for process uh, maturity to see how good you are at something. And uh, with it, historically, it started out with software development, but it's extended to any type of process management. Either you can't do it, you've, you've figured it out. I'm a musician, I might figure out a song once, and then I can keep playing it, keep playing it, and practice makes perfect, and I, and I eventually I can, I can do it every time, right? That's level two. So level zero, I can't do it. Level one, I got it done. Level two, I can do it every single time. Three, write it down. Score your music, right? Document your work. Um, level four, measure it. How long does it take? How much money does that cost? There's a lot of measurements you might take, and I'll, I'll tackle this more later. I do in my class. Um, and level five, can you get it done in less steps or less money, less time? All right, so it's not those. Bell, Apagio, and Beta. All right, let's go a little deeper into multi-level processing again. So multi-level uh, refers to having memory mapped out to where processes running, say I could run a, a program in, in this area of memory, and then I could have another one, so I could imagine a hotel, and I could have things going on in one floor that uh, are separated from the people on the second floor, or separated from people on the third floor. Now, you'd have multiple levels. Um, SC Linux, for instance, uh, can process up to 15 levels. Um, but compartment, it says I could have separate rooms in the same floor. Now, when they set these up, the most common way of doing this, the first formal access control model was Bell-Lapagula. 
And they were worried about confidentiality leaking. We were worried about the Russians stealing our secrets. So if you're processing things, say, at, and the levels you'll probably have to deal with in class, it would be top secret, which they didn't run on the same machine. That's a dedicated machine. Uh, even today, they don't <clears throat> necessarily run secret on the same machine as uh, lower classifications, but for your testing. All right, so we have, in this case, we'll have secret, confidential, and sensitive but unclassified, is all I've ever seen CIS history literature allude to. The different branches of the U.S. military use different terms. There's for official use only, or controlled, unclassified, whatever. They're the same thing. They just mean that it's unclassified, and yet it's kind of sort of. All right, so in our hotel, in our machine, let's say we're processing at three levels, and you're worried about confidentiality. We're dealing with reading and writing of information at a very basic level. Well, somebody at a lower level shouldn't be able to read information at the higher level. So that means if I'm on the first floor, I shouldn't be able to hear people talking on the second or third floor. I shouldn't be able to hear their conversations. All right, so no read up. That was considered the simple security property. Um, and not as obvious, but suppose somebody were to whether on purpose or by accident, uh, leak information down. So imagine somebody would say, uh, secret clearance, uh, printing something on an unclassified printer. So the simple property, simple is no read up. But not as obvious, we had the star property, or have the star property. So the star property says, don't let anybody at a higher level star, and it's typically written with an asterisk and an underscore. Star means no write down, no leakage of information. Well, Ken Bieber understood that this might help you with, with confidentiality, but um, integrity becomes compromised because somebody at a lower classification might be able to write information up that they themselves couldn't see, but wouldn't really be trusted, right? Our fake news. So Ken Bieber flip this upside down. And he said, if you're worried about integrity, simple, simple is always reading, no read down. Don't let somebody, uh, you know, like a newscaster pick up the National Enquirer and think that that's trusted news. And vice versa, don't know right up. For more on this, please take my class, but that's the basic concept. All right, so Spock uh, applies, you know, explains this to Captain Kirk. And then they have to get to their answer. Whoops, let's go back. So is it Bella Padula or is it Biba? Well, Spock has never been to this planet. He doesn't know who these people are. Hmm. Spock, it's not B and it's not C, but you don't know if it's A or D. Affirmative, Captain. Insufficient data. I don't know who Bella Padula or Biba are. And sometimes you just have to go with a hunch. And Kirk might say, I have a hunch it's D. Why, Captain? I seem to recall something at the academy on this. And I remember thinking that I and Beba stood for integrity. I've got nothing else. That's right, Spock. And you know what you don't have? You don't have time. We need to move on. And yes, that is the it is Delta. See, the only multi-level security models mentioned in this question that you'll probably deal with in your test, also known as a lattice-based access control, are Bella Padula and BBIT, and BLP, uh, which is supported in SC Linux. So people are like, what kind of systems support? There are a lot of military systems, but actually SC Linux supports it. It's not the default. Anybody who has installed Red Hat or CentOS or, or uh, Fedora, uh, the default actually has compartments. They actually have compartments. And you can compartmentalize it at a modern level today. It would be something like um, for uh, hosting 
virtual machines. So if you're worried about, you know, a hypervisor type of hack where something running on one compartment leaks over to another, you know, one virtual machine, you could run them in actual different compartments. So that's pretty cool. And it, it, it kind of it, it implements a form of the Clark Wilson model, but we'll save that for a long time for my class. Um, what BLP is concerned with protection of confidentiality and attempts to achieve this by preventing processes at lower levels from reading data at a higher level, and that's the symbol property, and conversely, by preventing processes at lower levels or higher levels from leaking, sometimes it's called a no spillage, the star property, uh, by writing uh, no write down. So uh, this approach would allow for data corruption, though, by allowing people at a lower trusted level to write data up, fake news. The BIBA model attempts to address, address this integrity vulnerability by enforcing rules exactly opposite of the BLP. All right, thank you very much. I hope you learned something today. Uh, may you all live long and prosper. And if you'd like to know more, I'd love for you to, uh, you to come and attend one of my classes. I do live online five day boot camps. I've been teaching this class since 2002 and uh, actually late 2001. And uh, uh, I also have recorded, uh, for, you know, each year I do a recording of my class and I sell that. So I uh, did very well with that. If you go on YouTube, you should look around. You'll see the reviews from my 2005 and 2006 I took down. 2007, I have the intro up there. And now I have 2008, I just started. So uh, if you'd like to purchase them or, or attend, please write me at sales at internetworkdefense.com or my company or see our schedule at internetworkdefense.com. Thank you again and may you all live long.